Imagine going on a mundane errand of returning a movie rental. This is something that wouldn't take very long and it's normally not something you would have to think too much about. But what if such a task changed the course of your life? We never know what's waiting for us just around the corner. This is a case that started out as an ordinary evening for a young woman but would end in tragedy. This case comes out of Dallas, Texas. On Sunday, October 11th, 2015, 18-year-old Zoe Hastings left her house at 4.30 p.m in her parents' white minivan to attend a Bible study class that would begin at 5 at the family's place of worship. This was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. She told her parents that she would be home right after the class ended for dinner. Zoe was excited to go to the Bible study that evening because she was going on a missionary trip with her church the following month, and this class would be going over instructions and preparations for the upcoming trip. Her parents expected Zoe to return home by 6.30 p.m., but that time came and went with no word from her. Zoe was not the type to go off to do something else without notifying her parents, so they became concerned almost right away. They tried calling her cell phone several times over the next few hours but could not reach her. All of their text messages went unanswered. Her parents contacted her friends and some of the people who attended the church, but no one had seen her. Through these calls, they discovered that Zoe had never made it to the 5 o'clock Bible study class. By 10 p.m., her parents contacted the police. They waited around for a few hours, but the police never showed up to take a report. So by midnight, they drove to their local police station to file a missing persons report, and then they began to look for her themselves. At some point during their search in the early hours of Monday morning, her parents realized that Zoe had a Find My iPhone app installed on her phone, and they were able to pinpoint her cell phone's location from it. Her phone was pinging near a creek that was only five minutes from their home. They rushed to the location, and upon reaching it, they saw several several police vehicles and an ambulance, and they already had the area cordoned off. Police informed them that they had found Zoe and that she was at the bottom of the creek deceased. The minivan Zoe had been driving was found crashed at the bottom of the creek, nose down in the creek bed. What initially appeared to be an accident was soon discovered to be a homicide. Zoe had been found several feet away from the crashed minivan's driver's side door, lying face down in her own blood. Her dress had been pulled up over her waist and her underwear had been pulled down near her knees, and her throat had been cut several times. The police found a bloody knife near her body and collected it for evidence. How was the crash discovered? A man named Kurt had been out walking his dog early Monday morning when another man approached him in a panic, stating that he had saw a van crash down in the creek. Kurt walked with this man down the slope of the creek, and they both could see that Zoe was dead. Kurt had been the one who had called 911, but the other man had had left the scene before police arrived. Police had been able to track where Zoe had been through her cell phone, and it showed that prior to ending up in the creek, Zoe had made a stop at a nearby Walgreens to return a Redbox film located just outside of the store. They were able to see that she returned the movie at 4.42 p.m., and her cell phone showed that she was in the creek by 5.01 p.m. From 5 p.m. till the time that the police were called, her phone had not moved from its location in the creek. Two witnesses came forward stating that they had saw Zoe being approached by a man as she walked back to her van. The first witness said that he was walking towards the Walgreens around 4.45 p.m. to get cigarettes when he saw a shorter, heavier-set African-American man who approached her very fast, grabbing the driver's side door of the van as Zoe was attempting to get in. This man was having an animated conversation with her, but the witness could not hear what he said. The conversation lasted maybe maybe five to ten seconds. Then the man got into the driver's seat and drove off with Zoe in the van. The witness did not try to get help because he thought that they were boyfriend and girlfriend. The second witness was across the street from the Walgreens around 4.45 when he also saw a heavyset African-American man who was about 5'8 or 5'9 in height walk up behind Zoe as she was getting in the van. He said the man was walking aggressively in a sneaky way but also trying not to draw too much attention to himself. The man put his arm out to prevent Zoe from getting away. The witness saw the man pull something out of his pocket, but he could not see what that was. The man said something to Zoe, and the next thing the witness saw was the man climbing into the van into the driver's seat. The man had forced Zoe to scoot over into the passenger seat as he climbed in. Now, this witness did attempt to seek help for her. He didn't have a cell phone, so he asked an employee at a convenience store to call police. Zoe would be sexually assaulted by this man, 
man and stabbed six times in her neck, causing her death. DNA was obtained from the handle of the pocket knife that was covered in Zoe's blood. That DNA led to a match that was already in their database of known offenders. The match belonged to 32-year-old Antonio Cochran. Antonio's criminal history went back 15 years for thefts, burglaries, and at least two sexual assaults. Antonio Cochran was arrested almost two weeks later on October 24th and was charged with capital murder. He was not charged with sexual assault even though seminal fluid had been found on Zoe's body. Forensics stated that there was not enough of the seminal sample to generate a genetic profile. Also, the medical examiner saw no evidence of trauma on her private areas to suggest rape. Throughout the investigation of this case, there was no evidence to show that Zoe and Antonio knew one another. This appeared to be a random attack a crime of opportunity. At trial, both witnesses believed that the man that they saw abducting Zoe was Antonio Cochran. Multiple hairs were recovered from the crime scene. A DNA analyst testified that Antonio's mitochondrial DNA profile could not be excluded from the hair that was recovered from Zoe's left hand. It was noted that mitochondrial DNA is not a unique identifier, so it could not be used to identify a particular person, but it could be used to exclude someone. Someone. Antonio's cell phone data placed him at the crime scene. He had texted several people that day, but between 3.19 p.m. and 9.30 p.m., he sent no text messages. At 4.34 p.m., his cell phone pinged off of a cell tower in Dallas that covered the area where the Walgreens store was at. Soon after 9.30 p.m. that night, Antonio sent a message to a friend saying, I really need you, bro. I don't know what to do. I'm not well. Two much has happened. I need you, bro. Two days before Zoe's murder, Antonio had started a new job. He was scheduled to work the day after Zoe's murder, but he did not show up for that shift. That night, he sent a text message to an ex-girlfriend saying, No, I was for you and my life is over. You'll find out soon enough. During the two weeks before Antonio's arrest, he made many web searches on his cell phone relating to Zoe's death. Antonio pled not guilty. Antonio's defense attorney stated that the police had nabbed the wrong guy. It wasn't him. Antonio had been helping a friend at the time of Zoe's murder. The attorney tried to discredit the two witnesses' testimony. He used the timeline line and the suspect description as points of contention with the first witness, the attorney told the jury that the second witness had a criminal record and could not be trusted. This second witness stated that he did not actually see the suspect's face, but he came forward even though he had an active warrant for his arrest because it was the right thing to do, even if he was going to get in trouble for it. The attorney questioned the DNA evidence. He agreed that Antonio's DNA was found on the handle of the knife, but he said the DNA had been placed there before the knife had been used to kill Zoe. How is this possible? His attorney argued that Antonio may have handled the knife while working at a nearby movie theater. Weapons such as knives were often found at this theater and he may have found the knife, picked it up, inadvertently leaving his DNA on it, and then later the killer, whoever he was, used the same knife to kill Zoe. Somehow though, the killer's DNA was not left on the knife. He didn't do much in the way of explaining how the killer may have gotten a hold of this knife that Antonio once handled. His attorney encouraged the jury to find Antonio not guilty because his fingerprints were not found anywhere inside or out of the van. He said, if he had grabbed the door as the witness stated, why didn't police find any of his fingerprints? He also drove home that there was no evidence of sexual assault. He claimed that prosecutors pushed the notion to taint the jury against him. The only thing linking Antonio to the crime was his DNA that was found on the handle of the knife. His attorney tried to cast as much doubt in the jury's minds about this DNA evidence. Prosecutors did not agree and asked the jury to find him guilty. For 23 hours over the next several days, the jury deliberated. The jury wanted clarification and further details in three areas. They wanted to know more about the mitochondrial DNA. They wanted more detail on the two witnesses' timeframes. And they also wanted pictures of the Walgreens 
Walgreen store where Zoe was taken. The jury had not been informed of Antonio's previous criminal convictions prior to giving their verdict, as it definitely would have swayed their decisions. In the end, Antonio was convicted of murder instead of the more serious offense of capital murder because the jury could not agree as to whether Zoe had been abducted or not. He was sentenced to life in prison with eligibility of parole after 30 years. He was also ordered to pay a $10,000 fine. Later, one of the jurors stated that she was speaking out because she wanted to set the record straight. She said, I wanted the parents to know that 11 of us knew that there was no way that their daughter was going to get into a car and drive off with a man that she didn't know. She went on to say that when the lone juror refused to budge after days of deliberations, they were forced to convict Cochran of the lesser charge of murder. She said it was never an option to fail to reach a verdict, even an unpopular one, because the majority of the jurors wanted to spare the family the ordeal of another trial. She said it wasn't about how we felt, it was about what they needed, and they needed this to be over. This is just another case of a young person's life being snuffed out tragically and way before their time. It's very sad indeed. I want to say thanks a lot if you've made it to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this case discussion. I would really love to know your thoughts on this case, so please let me know in the comment section down below. I plan to put out many more videos similar to this, so please consider subscribing so you don't miss them. If there is a specific case that you'd like me to cover, please let me know. I love to take requests. Thank Thank you once again, and remember, stay safe out there, people.